Today, we continue the conversation with an Australian poet of international renown. Rupert McCall grew up loving a jigsaw of words as much as he did a game of rugby league. It was like a creative collision was taking place within him, but somehow he chose to study law at university. His creativity keep, kept rearing its head amidst articling as a law clerk, and he managed to pen his first anthology, Rhymes, Idols, and Shenanigans, in 1993. Good title, Rupert. So <laughs> when his writing kept getting published, read out on radio, or featured at notable functions, he followed the snowball rolling down the hill and took a road less traveled to become the full-time poet he is today. As the author to six anthologies that have sold over 120,000 copies, he's been featured on TV and radio, and even a stint as a sport commentator. Rupert has crafted his own unique and sought after style of storytelling. Considered the poet of our generation in many Australian circles, he represented the opening to the prelude, prelude to Dawn Service in Gallipoli. He recited his poem, Firefighter's Dream, at Grand Zero to the New York City Fire Fire Department for the 10th anniversary of 9-11, as well as pay tribute to many sporting heroes like Roger Federer and Greg Norman. In 2013, he was awarded the OAM, which is the Order of Australian Medal by the Queen for his services to the community, particularly as a poet. So Rupert, this is all you, this is your life, and we cannot wait to figure out how a poet, sort of lawyer, sort of storyteller, dad, really makes this career work. So you ready to get into it? I'm absolutely ready after that introduction, Sarah. It's like my life, it's like my life just flashed before my eyes. <laughs> exactly. And it's school holidays in Australia. So sometimes it's nice when you have your kids around to be reminded that, you know, you're pretty great because sometimes our kids don't remind us about that. So here's the thing. My feeling about you, Rupert, is that you made poetry cool mm. in many circles. So I'm pretty curious how poetry enters into the world of a sports crazed little boy growing up. Yeah, that's, that's going right back to the beginning. And I think, I think, you know, most of us in the books that we read as, as young, young kids, you know, there was a, there was a rhyming um, sequence that, that, you know, that kind of like got into our, into our psyche, you know, whether it was Dr. Zeus, Mm -hmm. uh, or, uh, you know, I remember the books we read in, in, in grade one, it was like, you know, Sam and Pam and Digger. And, and then, and then in grade five, uh, you know, you're a little bit older and your teacher walks in and, uh, and hands out the, 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 the books to all of the, the desks. And, uh, you know, you have, you're asked to open up at a, at a certain page. And, uh, and on that page was the poetry of, of Banjo Patterson, uh, a famous Australian poet, of course, most renowned for waltzing Matilda. Mm. Uh, but this was uh, on the outer Baku where the churches are few and the men of religion are scanty on a road never crossed, set by folk who were lost. One Michael McGee had a shanty. Uh, the, the poem was a bush christening, you know, by Banjo. And uh, I think that we had to, had to learn it and recited to our to our parents for some kind of you know school school concert, mm. um, but at Litter Spark, I mean, mm. I, I love my sport as you as you as you mentioned. At the same time, um, in Queensland, anyway, uh, this was 1980, so a long time ago. But uh, at the same time, I got introduced to Banjo Patterson, a guy or a big footballer by the name of Arthur Beetson, Big Artie. Um, he led the Queensland State of Origin team out of the tunnel at Lang Park for the very first game of Origin. And uh, these things happen at about the same time. Banjo Patterson, Artie Beetson and, and Queensland against all the odds, they were given no chance, you know, winning that game against New South Wales. And so I think that's the that beautiful collision that you were talking about. I was just the, the right kid in the right place at the right time. Wow. that's I, I'm so glad you're talking about this because I have a five-year-old and we read Dr. Zeus and she rhymes all the time. And, and funny enough, I never kind of 
made that association that that's what she's doing. Like she's jigsawing words right now. Mm. She loves to rhyme everything. Sometimes she falls on really not good words when she's wow. rhyming, um, which causes great laughter. But ultimately, did you ever feel that these things didn't belong together? Because I'm noticing in myself that I feel like as I grew up really sporty and it's like I felt there was sport and then there was school mm. and, and there were two things happening. And I kind of sort of felt like I was riding like two different waves. How did you meld them? Like what, how did you even think to put them together? Mm. I, I didn't put them together straight away. Okay. Yeah. So that probably happened you know, years down the track, but um, well, actually, like maybe yeah, a few years after that, uh, my let let me just say that I think that 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 rhythm, mm. you know, the Doctor Zeus rhythm and, and others as well. I think it's part of our psyche. You know, it becomes part of the way our our heart beats. And the the ancient poets of Ireland, and probably you know other uh, other places, um, they were they were aware that you know this this uh philosophy i suppose of of taking what was happening around them you know whether it was love war uh, or, or sport <laughs> uh, and you know telling these stories to to the people to the masses you know in a in a rhythmic sense it became part of the heartbeat of uh of the world or the world that was, you know, in front of them. And these things, of course, you know, I had no idea of, you know, when I was in grade five, but as, as my life has evolved, you know, I've come to know that when you do it well, that's what happens. You know, you make a connection um, with the heartbeat in the lives of other people around you. And that, that's pretty uplifting, you know, it's, it's inspiring. But uh, yeah, the, the, the combination of sport and, and poetry wasn't something that I really had seen before or, or knew existed. It was just natural for me to do that. And, uh, you know, I wrote my first poem the following year. It wasn't, wasn't in a sporting sense. It was, uh, I think you know what, what it oh, was. The tree. <laughs> the, yeah, yeah. I, I saw, what was it called? A tribute to trees. <laughs> I was like, I could see my Jordan doing that. What's going on there? Yeah, grade six, uh, there was, it was like a competition. Um, for Arbor Day. So for those who don't know, and I probably wouldn't have if I wasn't told in grade six, you know, Arbor Day was the, I guess the day, like environmental day, you know, when we were encouraged to appreciate, you know, the, uh, what the, the purpose of trees were in, 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 the, in keeping the environment healthy. Um, so yeah, there you go, my, my first blockbuster was uh, this tribute to trees, which... Uh, I have I a felt... tree obsession. You don't have to explain this to me. Like, though, I would probably want to read that. And that would be probably the one I'd understand the best, right at my level. Well, maybe, because um, you were talking about, you know, your, your child and, and her, um, I guess, instinct you know, like to, to make, to put things together and the jigsaw pieces and, and, and make it fit, make it rhyme. And some of the words that, that don't go so well, because the, the, that poem, like, it wasn't all that great, to be honest, you know, like it was just my first attempt. And uh, I think it got a highly commended ribbon or something along those lines. It didn't even come first or second. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, that, that was, that was what my instinct said. That was how I was going to make a contribution to this competition. You know, other people were painting pictures and sketching and telling stories. I decided to write a poem and I guess I'm glad that I did. Isn't that beautiful? I have to share something with you because you may not know this, but in sport, my, when I, I shared the same coach as Nat did, um, Nat, who you know really well. I do. And his whole coaching philosophy, I'm not sure you met him, Steve Anderson, was around rhythm. And he was, he had a company, a dance company, bef like that was another thing he did, like a hip hop company. Yeah. And um, he used to, like it was all about beats and rhythm. Mm. 
And by the way, Nat and I both classify ourselves as the worst dancers ever. And I'll use Nat as an example, because she would say that's not her foray. However, her ability, her rhythm on the court is astounding, you know, and he was all about, it's just because this connection about rhythm with words and sport is like, he basically taught us all about rhythm and how, you know, even jumping higher was about being in rhythm. And, you know, when we set the ball, it's all about, he, he, he this is really sticks with me because he was very much a Zen philosopher. He used to say, you know, being early to the ball isn't what you want. You want to be in time with the ball. And he just took it to that next level. It's like the artistry of, of actually being a professional. And for me, that's what I felt like going from amateur to professional was being in rhythm and understanding the breath and, and all these things. And through listening to other athletes, you know, you start to hear a lot about the breath and they talk about rhythms and counts and things. And so I'm like, oh, just hearing you say the word rhythm, I thought. Mm, oh, really I absolutely cool. believe that to be the truth. I mean, just, I, I avoid the dance floor at all costs as well. So <laughs> let me just say that. But the, the best athletes, the best, uh, I guess, you know, performers in, in, any, in any sense, they really have a good sense of rhythm and balance. And you know, I try to incorporate that into my writing and reciting. Oh, so cool. I always, <laughs> I always get into long conversations with, um, with you, Rupert. I remember this well. <laughs> it's, it's like I'm having a remembering about how I have to hone it in for this. Um, yeah because I love the way that your mind works. So I really want to know though, because it's always weirded me out. How do you go and do a law degree? I'm not trying to insult the, law the lawyers. My brother's a lawyer, but <laughs> why a law degree when you were sort of moving down this creative path? Good question. Well, you know, I remember sitting with down with my, um, with my father and we looked at all the options and uh, I guess, you know, like, you know, poetry or, or uh, making a living out of poetry or as a storyteller, I probably didn't land on the table uh, at that point. And same with my career guidance officer, you know, in grade 10 at De La Salle College, you know, he didn't actually like throw, throw poetry up as an option. Uh, I guess, you know, I mean, there, there's, there's probably other pursuits perhaps journalism, um, you know, be, maybe just being, you know, setting my sights to, to, to be an author or something like that may have, you know, entered into the, uh, on, onto the radar. But, uh, you know, as, as it was, um, looking at the law and I was definitely, you know, m much more natural and accomplished at English as opposed to maths at school. So it was never going to be, you know, as a, as a scientist or a you know, mathematician or a physicist or anything like that, um, my brain was, was programmed differently. So we looked at the law and uh, it was like, yeah, you know, th that is a, a domain where, you know, you can uh, absorb the situation, the facts of the case or whatever, you know, and then kind of tell the story to the judge or to the jury, you know, present that creative, um, presentation that that you know hopefully might you know save someone's life or, or at least uh get get the job done in that respect so it was more a romantic notion you know of, of what the law could possibly offer and i suppose you know you you're watching t television la law and the shows that were on back then there was this kind of you know a real hollywood uh sense of 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 you know, the legal profession, which, which when you get into it, you know, when you study your four years and you end up, uh, you know, doing your articles and, and uh, getting sent out to the, to the office at Strathpine, you know, to, to look after what was, <laughs> yeah, what was going on out, out there. And I don't, I, I don't want to put the, the profession down and, you know, I have a lot of respect, you know, for that chapter in my life, but there were some really challenging situations out there, mostly in family law. Mm. And it wasn't, Hollywood, I'm telling you, yeah. you know, it, it was, it was a real dose of reality. And uh, yeah, for, for a poet like, like I was becoming at that, at that point, 
um, my personality, you know, I just couldn't, I couldn't leave it at the office. I couldn't just cut off mm. these traumatic, I guess, you know, I could say traumatic because they were in some respects, you know, where, where children were involved um, situations and and just leave them behind you know i carried that stuff with me and and there are some great professionals out there you know in the legal world who who do a great job you know in those kind of situations but i didn't think i was going to be one of them just not with my personality so i was yeah. damn lucky you know that i had another option or that i created another option for myself and i think um what I'm getting from you and a lot of different people that I seem to draw toward actually is people who live out on the skinny branch. And what I mean by that is, you know, law was something that you were being presented with as an option at school. Poetry wasn't even on the radar. Yeah. You know, as you're talking, I, I'm thinking about Oprah's sort of trajectory and she was like an orator at church, you know, and mm -hmm. nobody said to her, so why don't you, have a talk show for a living or why don't you know why don't you speak professionally you know that just doesn't come up as an option so my question to you is to actually take the step yeah uh, onto the skinny branch and travel that road that potentially you don't know one other person who's ever traveled which is to be a mm -hmm. full-time poet what did that take in you to make that step or it was it a jump a leap what, what was it well there's a combination of, of things that happen in your life that, that put you at that moment, uh, the crossroads. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, one of them, just thinking about it and being, being very honest, uh, I was engaged to be married um, to a girl that, you know, I mean, I was, we were young um, and it would have, it would have been a mistake, but, you make those mistakes when you're young. We were three months off getting married, you know, 22 years old. And, uh, and no names being mentioned here, but you know, she did, she did the wrong thing by me and, and uh, we didn't get married. And like my whole philosophy kind of changed, you know, with that trauma, like with that trauma, um, because, you know, I was very, I was upset at the time and thought, you know, when, when that, that happens and, um, but I, I came out the other end and I just thought, well, wow, I'm going to really like, you know, live my life. You know, I, 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 things have changed here and I was playing rugby. Uh, as I say, I studied law, I got my degree I was working as a solicitor. Um, and so I had this, this, uh, approach, you know, a perception that changed in, in my head that, uh, I didn't really care too much about, uh, you know, the securities in my life or the, or the future in a sense. I was just really living, you know, like from the heart and, and, and day by day. So, you know, having reconnected with that, that poetical passion, I was writing tributes, you know, to my sporting heroes mostly, sporting situations. And I was faxing them to to a mate of mine who was in another law law firm down the Gold Coast. We studied law together at QUT. That was Chris White, and uh, and he's and he's kind of identified that I, I had a little bit of talent. So he started sharing them with other people, and so by the end of 1993, I had enough poetry uh, to put into that book, Rhymes, Idols, and Shenanigans, that that you mentioned earlier, Sarah, and. Uh, you know, I was still in the law office, but it, it was becoming more apparent that I wasn't enjoying it. And this was starting to take some kind of uh, uh, momentum um, with the, the book that I put out, with the people that were, I guess, you know, reaffirming that, that it might be okay, the stuff that I was writing. Um, you know, Roy and HG, it, it got, it got uh, a go in Rugby League Week, um, you know, I spoke at a couple of, of events and, and functions. I was just so, you know, young and nervous, had no clue really, but uh, I was just going on instinct. So when I got to the crossroads, you know, six months into 1994, I really just felt 10 foot tall and bulletproof. Yeah. 
and I didn't have a mortgage. I didn't have a family. Um, I, I know there's lots of voices that, that you can listen to, you know, inside your own head <laughs> without sounding like a, 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 you know, crazed maniac. But uh, I, I chose to, to listen to the voice that told me to like trust my instinct mm. and do what you love doing, you know, follow the path of your greatest passion. It's what I try and tell kids, at, you know, in, in classrooms today, society might say that this is where you should go, where you have to go. You've, you've been educated. You've got a, a law degree, you know, you've studied all for all this reason. You have to, no, you don't have to go down that path. I mean, there's nothing wrong with, with turning left, you know, and taking the road less traveled, as was also mentioned in the intro. And uh, that's what I did. That's awesome. I'm having this like epiphany in speaking with you that, that I also grew up, I grew up with a mom who I think really allowed that to be true, what you just said. Mm. And I've also just noticed that when I talk with people, I'm always asking them, like, if you could make it up, what would you really be doing? You know, sort of this sense of it doesn't have to exist already um, and that you can actually carve your own path. But what I really appreciate about what you just said was we have these ideas that there's like rainbows and there's fireworks for you to at those crossroads, but there was actually a bit of trauma Sometimes that kind of like pushes us into a new direction, almost gives us courage, um, you know, liquid courage or something, um, gives us a little courage to go and do that. And I just, you did say, I didn't have a family and I didn't have a mortgage then. Mm. So it just made me want to know, what's it like today on the skinny branch <laughs> with a family and COVID and, you know, like feeling more responsible and how do you deal with that? Does that get, there's a friction for you there? Yeah. Oh, I have to, to dare myself, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to, to go back uh, and put myself in, back in those shoes, you know, to, to listen to the right voices. And, and, you know, I mean, there's a responsibility mm -hmm. that goes with having a family, you know, which is the, the top priority. Uh, so you respect that you know, without a doubt, but I still believe that, you know, if, if I am to be truly honest with myself, well, I ask myself the question and others might do the same. What is my best contribution to the world? You know, what, what does that look like? You've got to keep reminding yourself and keep asking yourself that question. And, you know, it, it wasn't back then as a family law solicitor, it was someone who wanted to to write the next chapter of of Australian, you know, stories in, in a poetical sense. It, it was like, you know, soaking up the oops, I just bumped my computer. Soaking <laughs> up the uh, you know the emotions and the character and the the inspiration of all the things that were happening around me, and challenging myself, like you know, like to put that into a format that could pave my way through life, you know, that was appreciated, you know, like by a wider audience to, to have the courage, I guess, you know, like to stand up on that stage because that was my greatest test. I was naturally a shy kid and I didn't really enjoy talking to people um, or not talking to people, but, you know, doing a speech, you know, in, in, in front of a big audience, that, that kind of talking, um, that was not natural to me. And I, I want to, to tell people, I have to tell people something about you because yeah. this impacts me when I see you is he doesn't just write the poems, he speaks them. And when you are share, when you share them and you share them off by heart, like you've memorized them, you're like fully, it's like an acting, you know, your, your body's fully into it. Hmm. I'm always blown away by that actually. Cause for me, that feels more daring than a speaker for some reason. Mm. There's something about the fact that these are the lines and if you don't say them, if you try to ad lib, they don't really rhyme anymore or they don't really have the same rhythm. So I guess 
like, how did you get there? How did you go from shy kid to being able to not only memorize, but deliver like that? Well, it was just, just through persistence. And I didn't have any, you know, formal speaking lessons or anything like that. Um, I just, I just kept doing it, you know, and because I believe that, that that was that was my um, destiny, and and uh, I was so nervous in some of those early early days. And people would tell me, "Gee, you look nervous up there." And didn't you know? I look back at myself, and I just I just knew that that I had to um, to get through that that early chapter of challenge. Mm-hmm. And and I think it was like. One day, just that that moment, you know, that uh, it's kind of like um, the light bulb switched on, and uh, and I said to myself, "This is not a chore. Like this is this is not um, something that you need to be stressed about. Like this is what I love doing. You know, I enjoy it. So embrace." the lectern, <laughs> embrace the yeah. stage, you know, every person out there, they're on your side. Like they don't want to see you fail. Maybe there might be a couple of doubters or critics, but they're the minority. Don't look at those faces. You know, look at that face that's got a smile and that's really enjoying it and it's contagious. So I just kind of had that turning point um, and, and reciting at Gallipoli in 2005 was really important too for my, for my sense of perspective, because I was I was speaking at the dawn service to thousands of people, you know, fifteen thousand people. Lucky it was dark and I couldn't see most of them, but but I knew they were there, and I was so nervous and scared and cold and frightened. You know, I was like, "Wow, what am I doing here?" You know, like I, it only seems like yesterday that I was, you know, riding my bike up Scarborough Road on the Redcliffe Peninsula, you know, and here I am, you know, speaking for my country. Mm. And, and somebody asked me if I wanted to borrow their scarf because I looked, I was turning purple. And, and I tried to say yes, and I couldn't even speak that word because it was so cold and I was, you know, I thought, wow, well, I'm, I'm in trouble here. You know, like, how am I going to recite this poem? And, uh, and then I thought about, you know, I guess it's a blessing, but I thought about, you know, those, um, mm. sorry for getting emotional, but I thought about those, you know, those young Australians who, like, you know, 90 years before, in exactly that same spot, they didn't, you know, they hardly had a chance. You know, they had to jump in, they were in a boat trying to get out of the water and onto the beach and somehow, you know, find a way to survive. And, uh, and all I had to do was recite a poem. <laughs> mm. So every time I get nervous now in front of big audiences and on big stages, I always go back to that moment of perspective and think, I love this. This is what I'm meant to do and just do it, you know, enjoy it. That's awesome. I heard a, a beautiful coach, high level coach say that pressure is privilege. And that, that just reminded me of that moment, you know, just the, the privilege to stand there. Yeah. And, you know, on behalf of history for your country. And it has me really wondering as a kid, and this is sort of, we ask a lot of athletes this question, but you know, when your head's on the pillow and you're young and you're sort of like the hero of your own story, it's like the dreaming is really active then. Did you used to dream about yourself as a sporting hero or did you... Or did you ever have a dream of you in front? Because here, that what you just described was almost like an athletic scene to me. That was my reference, like 15,000 people, you know, thousands of people and nervous and, you know, that kind of thing. Did you ever dream about that when you were young? I don't think I did. Um, uh, and you're right. When, when I stood up on the stage and... Uh, and I opened my mouth, it just, everything just flowed. Like it was, it was like I was in automatic pilot. It was like, it's like I 
or everything up and to the, up to that point in my life I had done for that for that moment for those three minutes mm. so um, again you know I feel blessed and uh, you know just even returning two questions back yeah. as a as a father of four children and you know with bills to pay and and the, the wolves at the door you know I still challenge myself like to 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 get through that with my with my best assets you know the best by doing what i love doing um and i have had moments you know where i've doubted myself and i thought what if i stayed in the law wouldn't i be better off financially you know would, wouldn't i be on holidays somewhere maybe mm. but um but i couldn't change a thing and you know I even like at one point um had a had some kind of breakdown okay uh, you know, with all of the pressures and I guess, you know, that roller coaster that I, that I signed up for willingly. Um, but, uh, you know, we may maybe talk about that another time. Mm. Um, but the, the, yeah, the analogy of, um, yeah, the, the sports person, you know, who trains all their life, you know, for, the, for that big moment mm. kind of felt that kind of felt like, um, um, what it was, not only uh, at, at uh, Anzac Cove, but also at at Ground Zero, you know, for the New York Fire Department uh, and the ninth anniversary of September 11. And you were there, like, paint that scene for us of what that was like. Well, um, yeah, you know, I just, um, <laughs> After the, after the breakdown, and I don't want to make light of it because... Well, you, your you know, breakdown happened before 2011 then? Yeah, yeah. 2010 was when I first spoke at Grand Zero. And 2007, I commentated the Rugby World Cup in France for Channel 10. And whilst that was a wonderful challenge, it was really, really intense. And probably, if I was to be honest, you know, I might not have been ready ready for that sometimes you try and do too many things in your life you know and and uh i um yeah we had two four children a couple of really little ones and you know i wasn't getting enough sleep anyway i got back from from the rugby world cup and i was doing radio and and then channel nine asked me if i wanted to do this television show called weekend extra um which i thought yeah yeah let's do this because they had the next olympics and the rugby world cup and so that so I left radio behind. Um, I was doing some television, uh, 2008 GFC, um, and a lot of things, you know, went down with the ship. So <laughs> having said that, it's nothing compared to 2020. Um, you know, uh, so Channel 9, that ended. I just said, no more show. And, uh, you know, I left radio and I kind of felt like I had nowhere to go. I didn't know what to do. Uh, it was back to the back to the drawing board with with a renovation having just been you know done at home oh my goodness and uh, kids you know sleeping in our bed and <laughs> it was like you know on top of you yeah I was drinking way too much coffee and you know I just thought I was having a heart attack um, so and I, I thought there was something wrong with me I just kept going back to the doctor and and you know, I did all every test, and in the end, they just said anxiety. You know, that that's mm. what's what's going on. So, um, not long after that, um, a friend of mine who was a firefighter uh, told me about this uh, this thing that he was doing in America uh, to honour the fallen firefighters and their families. And this bunch of Aussie firefighters were going over there to do a charity run called the tour of duty and he said would you could you write something you know for us I said so we sat down at a breakfast he told me a couple of stories about some of the guys they were running with um, in in america including one young man who lost his dad in in september 11. He, it was his 13th birthday you know the day before and his dad said oh listen we won't have your birthday celebration today we'll do it and i get home from work tomorrow and of course he never got home from work so James Dowdell became a firefighter himself. And so, so this was, that was kind of like, if you, if you listen to the poem, A Firefighter's Dream, you've got to understand that it, it comes from, 
from that story. Wow. And uh, I, I try to tell, you know, I try not to ramble too much here, but like, yeah, I, I wrote this poem. They took it with them. Um, I recited it to them the day before they left uh, down in Sydney. They recorded it, took it with them and played it to the American firefighters in the Australian consulate in Los Angeles. And the captain of rescue too, who was at the coalface of 9-11, Liam Flaherty, in his big, broad Brooklyn accent, he rings me and says, brother, I want you to come to New York to recite that poem, mm. you know, on, on, sept on September 11, which, which was like 30 days time because this, this run, charity run, was going to take that, that, that length. Um, so, yeah, th there you go. Next thing you know, I'm standing on that stage and it changed my life. And all of the adversity that I just kind of experienced, what I've just described, um, it felt like, again, that I, was, that I needed to be in that place at that time to take on this writing assignment and to be in New York to prove to myself that I could write something that could resonate with with a species of human beings on the on a, the other side of the planet. And when you share your life and you do that so beautifully, thank you for being so honest. It's like get that you the amount of trust that you have, like you're at a breakfast with someone who tells you a story, who then asks you, will you come, you know, all the thread that you had to say yes to and trust in order to be standing in front of those firefighters in 2011. I just, I think we all can learn something about, that's what I'm getting from you is the sense of trust, that guiding force, you know? And if you're okay with it, and by the way, I didn't really warn him about this. He just did share this poem with me about these unusual, unique times we're currently in, Rupert. Yeah. I would love, for people to get a sense of, you know, how you express yourself, your storytell. So would you mind sharing just to end this amazing first conversation? Because I have about 200 questions about your creative process that I did not ask. So if you're cool with it, I'd love to have you on again. But for today, would you mind reading um, what you've written in these times that you're going through as a dad, as a family member? But I would love to hear your, I feel like you're just the storyteller um, you kind of are able to resonate with us. So I'd love you to share that to end us off. No, no problem. Um, Thank you. So, so, uh, so my message is, you know, trust those instincts. Um, after, before I recite every poem just about for the first time, especially Firefighter's Dream, I had this moment of doubt where I, where I, it's that other voice, you know, the bad voice that, that, that says, is this really good enough? like for this stage, you know, for these people. Mm. But, but don't listen to that voice, folks. You know, just get through that, that little moment of doubt and, and follow the path of, of your passion. Mm. I was, um, at all costs, I was uh, in quarantine at the start of the COVID thing because I was on a flight up to, to watch the Broncos play the Cowboys okay. um, in, better, in better days. Uh, when... Um, you know, Queensland Health rang me and said, oh, you're sitting next to someone with, with a positive case. And so I had some really, really kind of dark nights mm. thinking about, you know, who we are, who we are and how we're going to get through this. So um, I wrote this in the middle of the night, middle of a dark night. It's a true story. Um, thanks so much, Sarah. I was, so much, uh, you know, love talking to you. It's really awesome. And say hello to Nat for me. I will. Here we go. Take, take a breath. The night will fade. The sun, again, will rise. Think about the history that is streaming in your eyes. This epic documentary of an island and its flow as we stand upon the precipice to fight another foe. Remember what we've been through since the dawning of the dream. The sum of every conquest that illuminates our gleam. The hurt that brought us closer. The pain that made us strong. The way that we responded when humanity went wrong. Adversity 
as endless as the beaches on our shores. Fire, flood, depression, drought, the toll of countless wars, homes in ashes, market crashes. All these things we've met and all these things have scarred us, but we've not been beaten yet. Yes, the sun continues skyward uh, like it did the day before. How did we defy the monster knocking down our door? Well, it's only just a theory of one humble passerby, but something seemed to happen when we looked it in the eye. A chemical reaction of the blood and in the bone, a secret to survival that could not be won alone, a collective kind of courage that was made to persevere when things were at their darkest. We refused to feed the fear. Instead, our hand extended to a sister and a brother. We were surely at our best when we were there for one another. Our mate, our mob, our kin, our clan, our family, our flock, like some southern born battalion with the spirit of the rock. Uh, a selfless kind of honour that stood tall beside our name. A pride that linked our DNA. A pride that knew no shame. If we reach our destination, then we go that extra mile. And when the load was heaviest, we'd lift it with a smile. Unbroken by catastrophe, despite all that we lost, we just couldn't throw the towel in, folks. We would fight at any cost, no matter where we came from. What united us was treasured. This, when all is said and done, is how our tribe was measured. The wind is blowing ill outside. Uncertainty is rife. It's a chilling desecration on our precious way of life. The sun is setting silently. The night will soon be here. When we wake, we wake tomorrow with this newfound smell of fear. Well, who knows what it looks like when we reach the other side? But I guarantee we'll get there and our spirit won't have died. Because although we can't join arms to fight this terrifying fight, our hearts will beat together. And I think we'll be all right. Wow. Thank you. What an honor. Nice day. What an honor. Thank Soak you. Soak up the sunshine. Don't uh, have, don't have, try not to have too many regrets. It's just keep moving forward and uh, we'll, we'll get through. Thank you so much for sharing what's inside of us all. Beautiful. Thank you, Sarah.